So hello, everybody. I'm Alexander. Um, I'm uh, a developer working for Linuxtronics. Um, my interest are, uh, interests are embedded systems, Yocto and uh, Linux user space. So I'm really not a kernel developer. So the subject today is uh, how do we survive uh, that fateful date? Uh, how do we prevent our uh, critical infrastructure from collapsing? But first, uh, I want to quickly uh, describe what what is the problem. And to know what is the problem, we need to first uh, uh, look at what uh, what is time, how is time represented on Unix systems. And it's an integer that contains the amount of seconds since uh, 1970. It's very simple. It's very convenient. It's not a structure. You can use elementary operations on it. Um, but uh, the problem is that uh, nobody made a standard that says how many bits that integer should contain. And so uh, implementations uh, decided to just use elementary uh, seed uh, integer data types for time and that created, created a big problem. Um, so uh, what is uh, the problem? Uh, so until quite recently the biggest integer type you could use in C was called long and um, long is uh, defined uh, rather loosely as it must contain um, at least 32 bits. And on 32-bit systems, it, that's exactly how many bits it contains. Um, because um, integer types in C, um, it's recommended to map them directly to hardware. And 32-bit hardware can uh, manipulate uh, easily maximum of 32 bits with um, CPU instructions. And at the time, nobody thought that uh, this is not future-proof and this will actually overflow in 2038. And you see what happens on the left side. So we run out of bits and the whole thing uh, flips over. Uh, so um, I want to show you a demo of what is actually going to happen. Um, so it's a live demo, and uh, um, I need to see the screen. Is the uh, is the font big enough for you to see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I'm um, <coughs> I'm gonna boot a. Uh, uh, Linux system in a virtual machine in QEMU. Uh, it's a like minimal Linux image built with uh, uh, with Yocto uh, version Kirkstone released uh, two years ago that uh, didn't do anything to fix the problem and then we um, we see what happens. So right now it has like the current date, but we need to set the date. We need to set the date to just um, a few seconds before that uh, rollover. Yeah. I think I got it right. Yeah, so it in a few seconds it should roll over. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so now um, at this point, anything that relies on correctness of the system date will no longer work. I guess um, 
like security certificates that have validity dates in them or HTTP cookies or anything else. Um, so let's uh, see if we can at least list some files. We can, but only once. Uh, then uh, now we cannot really run scripts anymore. And uh, I guess at this point we really have something that is connected into power but doesn't do its function. So let's call uh, the vendor and the vendor will tell us, have you tried switching it off and on again? Um, so that's what we do. Uh, okay. Uh, so we can't even switch it off, assuming we even had the working command line at this at this point. And okay, help. And even the even the command line is no longer interpreted correctly. We typed help, and it thinks we typed p. So there you have a system that is plugged in, but is completely non-functional. And the only thing you can do at this point is to physically walk to it and pull the plug. And uh, if that is a system that uh, supplies electricity, controls traffic, or um, uh, operates uh, something in an intensive care unit, you really don't want to be dependent on it. Um, okay, uh, so next I'm going to show you a um, second demo which is done with the newer version of Yocto. Um, uh, so this is a uh, SCARF gap which was released uh, three months ago and we do the same thing, yeah. Okay, so it rolls over at, at seven seconds past 14. Okay, so uh, it's still a 32-bit system, but it seems to be doing better. And we, we can... Uh, we can still list files, so at least the if you are a Yocto user, you must update to this newer system and if if this was all you need to do i would be a very happy person but unfortunately it's just the first necessary step you need to get your product ready and uh, the rest of the talk uh, is about what else uh, do you need to do and this is the outline of uh, what needs to be done. So first of all, um, uh, you well, you need to replace a 32-bit representation of time with 64-bit representation of time throughout your software stack. It should be good for the next many billions of years and then it's uh, someone else's problem. Uh, so which are the parts that you need to take care of? Uh, the kernel, and there are three things in the kernel. It's uh, syscall API, uh, the, towards user space, that time handling uh, inside the kernel, and uh, the file systems, because they also contain timestamps. Then you need to make sure that 64 bits are used in the C library. Then once you've done those things, you need to rebuild your whole user space from source, and you also need to rebuild the vendor blobs. Um, uh, and then uh, you're still not done. You need to simulate, like I just did, that uh, this event actually occurs and nothing breaks, and check that you don't have accidental truncation of bits um, 
happening invisibly inside uh, your applications. So let's uh, look, look at these things one by one. So um, the kernel API, the syscall API, uh, so 64-bit systems always used 64 bits, so they're safe. And then uh, there are like old classical 32-bit systems and the recent ones, so the recent ones like RISC-V and uh, X32 also were designed from the start to do this right. But uh, the classic 32-bit uh, systems got an API extension in 5.1 and the old uh, APIs uh, kind of stayed as they were because, you know, the philosophy of Linux kernel that we never break things. If there is an API, we will support it until the end of time, but you can optionally disable it. So these um, classic 32-bit systems are ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, 32-bit x86, and a few like more esoteric ones. So you need at least that kernel 5.1. Then there is internal time handling in inside the kernel. Um, you can uh, see what has been done with this git log command and my impression was that the bulk of the fixes are in 5.6 um, and there is some uh, work happened after that but um, uh, this is where 5.6 is where things really got solved and if you're stuck with the evil um, vendor kernel I don't know what to recommend you otherwise that don't, don't use evil vendor kernels and uh, yeah I think Arndt Bergman did most of the work so I Want to, uh, I would like to appreciate that because I don't know anything about the kernel and I would not have been able to really do any of it. Uh, so yeah, that covers the kernel and uh, the next step moving up the software stack is uh, the C library. So the C library defines a type called time t and all um, all it says, all it kind of guarantees that it's an integer. Um, no, um, nothing, no anywhere specifies how many bits it should have. So before we look at uh, glibc, I want to say uh, quickly about muscle library, which is popular in embedded uh, use cases. So what they did, they just um, switched over to 64 bits, um, did a hard uh, like switch over and they say uh, just recompile your whole thing, deploy it to a device like a full image update and then you should be good to go. Yeah, with uh, evil vendor blobs obviously. So glibc is more complicated uh, because it's used on uh, binary distros on the desktop like Red Hat, um, Debian, Ubuntu and you cannot just do this kind of thing. You need to preserve backwards compatibility. So next slide is about glibc. So what goes on there? On a 32-bit system, glibc offers a pair of every um, time-related uh, function um, in 32-bit versions and 64-bit versions that you can see with tools like NM that there is like this time symbol that 32-bit that will break in 2038 and there is this underscore underscore time 64 that is the one that you should be using. So by default, if you build your software, you will get the 32-bit version. So that's not the right thing. And you need to opt into the right version by passing this magic definition to the compiler and you rebuild the full system. 
and uh, there is some magic in glibc headers that will pick the right function for you. Yeah, and don't forget that blobs uh, also should be rebuilt. Um, and now I can explain why uh, older Yocto breaks and newer Yocto does not. It's because between those two versions, we actually set this globally in a uh, configuration and Yocto is a source-based toolkit for making Linux distributions. So when this is set globally and you rebuild, you get a, a stack um, that works. Um, so all of this again applies only to classical 32-bit systems, uh, ARM x86 and PowerPC and MIPS and the RISC-V uh, has um, only 64-bit from the start. Um, so we are not done with glibc yet. Uh, this header magic is all nice, but it doesn't work in two cases. Um, first is when somebody directly uh, links with 32-bit uh, symbols like Rust, for example, I'll get to that, or they use DL sim to look up the wrong, uh, the wrong version. Um, so I have an example here in glib where they open this clock get time and this isn't uh, safe. So if you want the 64-bit version, you need this underscore underscore stuff. And that's uh, the fix I made and submitted to them. So now we get, we get to Rust, yeah? So it's my chance to raise concerns about Rust. Um, pretty much everything uh, in there uses this libc crate that interfaces with the C library. And that crate, uh, again, uh, links with 32-bit um, symbols in glibc, and it will break in 2038 quite badly. And this was actually caught by one of the QA tests we have in Yocto. So there is a pull request to fix this stuff. Um, I have a link, but it's been stuck in review hell for a very long time now. So if Rust matters to you, if your product is 32-bit, then you should head to that pull request and see what you can do to push it forward. And once it's merged, Again, that's not the end of your trouble because the way Rust works is that it, um, uh, when it builds a component, it kind of pulls all the dependencies into the build tree and makes a gigantic static executable out of it. There is no concept of a system library that you can fix on the system and then everything is fixed. So everybody needs to update to a libc crate that's fixed, then they need to make a release, then uh, that release should be picked up by somebody using that component, and it's kind of a recursive process with unclear end to that recursion until everything is in the ecosystem gets uh, the fixed versions. But hopefully there is still 14 years to fix this stuff, and I hope they get to it. So let's um, uh, assume everything I mentioned so far has been checked and fixed. Um, how do you check that your system is actually safe, that it's ready for your 2038? So you need to have a clear definition of what it means that, that you have a working system. Um, and you need tests that implement that definition that tests should be automated and that tests should be installable on your target system and not just something that's run as part of your build process on a different machine. And then you boot your system and run those tests um, with your system clock set to like beyond that date or you can test the rollover 
as well, like I showed you previously. Uh, so I want to show a specific example of this, how we do this in Yocto. So there is a, a link to the definition of a working system. It's a set of um, like build and test configuration and we run this on our auto builder cluster uh, against every change that is proposed. And if a change is breaking something, that change will be rejected. So we only do this in the QMO emulator, unfortunately. We don't have resources to do real testing on targets. So for year 2038, I made a private modification so that uh, QMO would start with the system clock set to 2040. This is how you do it if you are a Yocto user. And a number of issues were discovered, even with everything that um, was fixed in the previous slides, there are still problems. And uh, that's uh, what I'll talk about next. So before we talk about that, I want to talk about the importance of installable tests, right? It's something that you don't just run as part of your build. You, it's something that you install on your target system and you run it in your actual target environment. Because historically in the GNU project, uh, there was no like concept of cross-compiling and cross-installing the artifacts. You build and run things all on the same machine. Unfortunately, this is really getting in the way. And um, GNOME project um, has got it right and they have a very nice uh, document linked here that explains in detail why well, this is important. So GNOME gets it right, Python gets it mostly right. Uh, GNU, unfortunately, is not really getting it right at all. And uh, for some of the GNU components, the most important ones, we kind of hacked around it, but there is no uh, universal way to do installable tests. But if you are in charge of your of some component, make sure that your tests can be packaged and installed. And if you are a Yocto user, we always welcome more of those installable tests. Right, so what are the issues that this testing can expose? Uh, four types. So. If you are glibc, you can bypass all those header redirection tricks. This we I've already covered. Then you can have test data that makes assumptions about the system date. It assumes the tests are run in the present and then it breaks when you set the date on your machine to the future. Um, then there are components that deliberately use 32 bits for integers. We'll get to that as well. And then the worst thing and the most dangerous thing is accidental truncation of bits when you take time t, which is 64 bit, and assign it to a C integer type that has less bits. And we'll get to that as well. So test data that can't handle the future, it's typically things like cert test certificates, test HTTP cookies, uh, they have hard-coded dates inside them that says this ends in like 2030 or something. Um, this is easy to fix, but uh, unfortunately not always easy for whatever reasons to get upstream to, to merge. Um, like sometimes upstream, has certificates, but they don't know how to regenerate them because the developer that supplied them has disappeared and there is no script to regenerate uh, the certificates. And that's the situation we have with OpenSSL. Fairly important project, I'd say. Uh, um, so the second... Um, issue is that some projects intentionally use 32 bits. Typically, like uh, two cases I found was like runtimes or shell implementations. Um, Perl and 
busy box. So you need to reconfigure them to say uh, for like Perl scripts and shell scripts, I want integers you to put integers into 64 bits. And uh, in Yocto, this is fixed, but I don't know if projects like Debian or others do it. And yeah, if you don't do it, then and you handle timestamps in your scripts, then there will be problems. And, and now we get to accidental truncation. And before that, I want to talk for a bit why C is not my favorite programming language. Um, and it's not because of memory safety today, a lack of memory safety. It's because of the way it handles um, elementary integer types. So first of all, the definitions are vague. It says int is at least 16 bits, long is at least 32 bits, long, long is uh, at least 64 bits, and then you can assign one to the other, and uh, the compiler is totally fine with this. It will not warn you. It assumes you know what you are doing, and um, if you make a mistake, it's like um, programmer's fault, and everybody is a world-class expert in C. Yeah. Unfortunately, reality is different, and even uh, mistakes like this are easy easy to make even for very experienced programmers and I know this from the issues I found so I'll get to it, this so here's um, a s small C program to demonstrate it so we first print uh, like the sizes of long and time t 4 and 8 respectively then we get the, the current time that would fit in 32 bits and assign from time t to long, and that assignment is correct. But then we set the 64-bit time to something that needs 64 bits, and then we assign it to 32 bits, and bits get truncated, as you can see. But uh, when we compile it with um, a 32-bit uh, GCC, and passing all those magic flags to glibc to do uh, like um, um, the gcc is still fine with those assignments i mean uh, it's it's okay and, and then we run the program and um, uh, when we assign a future date to a 32-bit long uh, variable then it's no longer correct so, and uh, this is not theoretical. Here is a list of, again, fairly important components in a typical Linux system, which uh, found to uh, the test suits were breaking uh, in my testing because of this, because they have a long variable somewhere deep in the code and they assign timestamps to it. Uh, so I made a few pull requests, and you can click on links if you want to see the code that uh, contained those mistakes. But uh, the point I wanted to make is something else. Uh, these issues would never have been found if uh, we didn't have tests that are installable, and they can be run on a 32-bit system with a date set in the future if um, people would just run those tests on a typical CI environment, they pass just fine, but they will break in uh, 2038. And another point is that RISC-V users are not safe from this. This is the issue that uh, affects those systems as well. And uh, why I'm particularly worried is that how many more of such problems are unknown. Um, I mean, Yocto project tests some of the key pieces, but a lot more of them don't have such uh, tests. So maybe there are static analysis tools that can be can help you, but I really don't know. Can they find such issues without 
uh, drowning everybody in irrelevant noise um, about like uh, something of one type uh, being assigned to a different type. And the next subject is um, given what I just said, that it's not possible to conclusively prove that a system is safe. Should we just migrate to 64-bit hardware and uh, kind of decommission and throw away the 32-bit silicon? And uh, yes, maybe you need to look at the costs of doing so. Maybe it's actually cheaper and easier to do that. 64-bit uh, systems are much safer, but they're not safe. And why is that? Quite often they contain 32-bit compatibility layers, like a specially installed 32-bit library supporting some evil vendor blob that was delivered decades ago and nobody has the source code for, but that blob performs a critical function. So you need to check your system that you don't have that. And another possibility is uh, that you accidentally write time t into int, and it's the same issue as just shown, writing time t into long bits will get truncated and uh, time will not be represented correctly. And then what's also possible is that various protocol data formats, uh, like things you send, bytes you send on the wire, um, encode time in 32 bits, especially if they're proprietary. So you need to check for that. And at the end of the day, you really should verify your systems same way as uh, like 64-bit, same way as um, uh, 32 bits. Okay, so conclusion-ish, because I don't have a nice conclusion, I can only say that there is, I think there is no way to conclusively prove that any product is safe. There are only degrees of likelihood. And the scariest sub-problem is this uh, truncation because of how C was designed. So to try and ensure this truncation doesn't happen, you need tests for a complete system and you need to run them with a system clock set to after 2038. And uh, I want also to kind of raise this point that I don't think it's okay when vendors ship black boxes that run critical infrastructure. The public does need to know that what is inside those boxes and we need legislation that requires software bills of materials to be published for everything that, that our lives depend on. Um, uh, and that would be the first step, but ideally the source code as well. It doesn't need to be under GPL, but it needs to be available for inspection, but one step at a time, I suppose. And uh, given what I said, um, I won't be traveling or staying in a hospital in, on that date, but unfortunately it's in the middle of winter, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. We need heating, we need electricity. So let's see how it goes. And for Yocto users, there are a couple of links that um, uh, you should uh, check. And I think we have about six minutes. So thank you very much. And please, questions. <laughs> We want. Hello. So I was under the impression that the uh, time will roll over in 2038 back to, uh, I think it's like 1901, mm -hmm. if you, if, since it's like negative number. But with the first live demo you show with date, uh, it seems only roll back to 1970 like the beginning of time. So like, uh, uh, is it due to implementation details? I think it's a, um, I think it's a implementation detail of the, of the shell of the date command. Um, 
but uh, either way the date is the incorrect okay thank you Thanks for a very interesting presentation. I've been uh, exposed to this problem myself and I know how complicated it can be. I was wondering if you have experience with any other build systems than Yocto, open embedded build route and, and so on. Well, uh, Yocto is uh, open embedded. Um, uh, build, build route, um, I think they had plans to do this time beats equal 64 thing. Um, I don't know how far uh, they got. Uh, the only other project that cares in any way about this is Debian. They are in a more difficult position because they're a binary distro. They cannot just um, rebuild and uh, erase everything old and install everything new. So they built compatible libraries one by one and push them through the package update mechanism. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, sure it does. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, do you know of any other components that may have different problems? Like, for example, um, we noticed that MariaDB um, won't start after 2038. And when using the wrong um, SQL, I think it's a timestamp, then you can't use dates beyond the date even before 2038. Um, I've only tested things in the core layer of Yocto Maria. The B is not a part of that. Um, but I vaguely heard that a more recent version of it have some work to address the issue. But again, I can't possibly fix the whole stack. No, no, no the, the, que the question was more, do you know if there is any other people um, searching for things? Are there known problems? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so as the author of the Rust patch mentioned before, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of related issues. For instance, if you use the syscalls directly without going through glibc, the, the preprocessor symbol won't help you at all. And the scanner that we use in Yocto checks for the glibc symbols in your produced binaries, so it won't find syscalls that are made through the syscall um, well, mechanism. And the one of the funny things with the, the preprocessor symbols is that you can actually build an executable where various C files have been built with different options. So you can have time T be 32 bits in parts of your program and 64 bits in other parts of your program. And if you fiddle too much with the, the preprocessor symbol or C flags in your build system, you can run into these types of issues. Well, Yocto is a source-based uh, toolkit for distribution, so we force everything to uh, only use one or the other. There is no mixing, but uh, other places can have this problem. I think I have some other points, but I think I forgot them. I, <laughs> I can talk more about this later. Questions? More? We have still one minute. Just a quick question. What do you believe are the uh, uh, most impacted application areas? I know avionics is one of them, but do you believe there are others? I don't know. I live in an open source bubble. I haven't worked on commercial products in a couple years. Uh, all of those things are black boxes, vendors saying, trust us, we know what we are doing. But I sure as hell won't be in a hospital or flying. So from railway, I can tell you that people are now asking for solutions, for analysis, for how can we roll it out now? Mm -hmm. so. Okay, then uh, thank you very much and uh, I'm available uh, to come and talk.